Good morning, everybody. At this time, I want to welcome our live streaming guests to the NAOP Colorado third annual town hall event. Um, as you all remember, last year's town hall event had to be virtual, and it is so amazing to look out and actually see humans in three dimensions, I'm not looking at that teeny tiny Brady Bunch screen uh, back in my office. For those of you who are still standing, if I could get you to take a seat, we want to make sure that we get started. We have a full, full program this morning, and we do have a couple of announcements before we get started. As I mentioned, more coffee will come to you at your tables, as will your breakfast as soon as you have a chance to be seated. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Kathy Barsner. I'm NAOP Colorado's Executive Director. And welcome, officially, to the third annual NAOP Colorado Town Hall Breakfast Meeting. And welcome to our guests who are joining us virtually. We're so, so happy to have all of you here with us. Just a couple of announcements before we get started. For those of you who are joining us virtually, a couple of things that you'll want to know um, to make sure that you enjoy the programming the best. We, re we recommend that you view the program in full screen mode. And there will be a live chat function that we encourage you to use so that you participate during the program, we also will have some live streaming. For those of you who are virtual um, and won't be participating in the roundtable discussions, you can participate through that polling and we'll give you more information on that as we get closer. One of the things, shh, thank you. One of the things I would like for us to do really quickly before we get started, I heard some of the wait staff this morning as they were setting up the room saying that this was strange to them because it was one of the first times they've actually been back together and, and taking care of a group of people. So would you please give a round of applause to our wait staff who are taking such great care of us. Thank you. And uh, so I want to make sure that we thank our breakfast sponsors. We don't do these events without our incredible sponsors. And you'll see behind Will and I this morning, we have a listing of all of our sponsors. But I want to give a particular thank you to our sustaining sponsor, Brownstein Hyatt Farber Shrek. Can't do this without you. To our supporting sponsors, Alcorn Construction. And today we actually have a special supporting sponsor, um, our co-host today and an industry partner, AGC Colorado. And at this point, I want to invite Michael Gifford, AGC Colorado's president, to come up. NAOP Colorado and AGC have a great industry partnership. And uh, it's always a pleasure to, when we're, whether it's doing an event like this, or making presentations to the legislature, uh, which cause great um, anxiety, to know that we have industry partners like AGC. Welcome, Michael. Thank you so much. Is this one on? Uh, thank you very much, Kathy. And uh, just for those of you who don't know, AGC is a national association, 28,000 commercial contractors, general contractors and specialty contractors. Here in Colorado, we have 650 of the leading general and specialty contractors and suppliers in the Colorado chapter. We're proud to work with NAOP at the state capitol at uh, Denver City Hall. In addition to that, we've been working on some uh, rulemakings with the Air Quality uh, Control Commission and working on ballot measures that you see at the state level and uh, in Denver, <laughs> enough to tire us out. So we are happy to be partners with NAOP and we've had some uh, great success together and now we're happy to add to our partnership uh, economics and the things that we'll be facing going forward. So we're glad to be here this morning and Kathy, thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. Really appreciate that. 
Okay, so um, since, unfortunately, due to some rogue nights, we don't have any professional hockey continuing on in Colorado that we care about, so I'm sure you want to think about other ways that you can enjoy that wonderful winter sport. So at this time, I want to bring up uh, past president James Mansfield, who will give us some a highlight of our upcoming Winter Classic hockey event. James? Thanks, Kathy. Can you hang, hang up here, uh, right here? We just want to, we don't want to disclose you yet what we have here. So glad to be with you again. And uh, once again, hockey is back. And the uh, NAOP hockey, for those of you that are not familiar with NAOP hockey, we have a winter classic. And yes, it's held in August every year. And this is the one event that NAOP puts on where 100% of the uh, proceeds goes towards Children's Hospital. Our primary sponsor is Randy Hurdle with Majestic, and it's called the Majestic Cup. And in the six years, we have raised in excess of $150,000 that have gone to uh, Children's Hospital to fight uh, cancer. And uh, it is fantastic. That, uh, that foundation right now has over $2 million in it. So Randy has just done a terrific job with that. But this year is a special year because with COVID, we've had so many people who have moved to Colorado. And uh, I was just talking to uh, Molly here from Cushman and Wakefield, who has just moved here from, Colorado, or from uh, I believe, Wisconsin, from Milwaukee. And we have something special for you. So if you sign up and you play hockey and you've said, wow, this is a great opportunity to network, our hockey event is on August 11th, and the way you do it is if you're a hockey player, sign up, tell us what level you allegedly play in, and we'll place you on a team. All of our teams are sponsored by either brokerage firms or CoStar. We, have, uh, we also have um, uh, some AGC members as well. Um, we have uh, Wells Concrete as one of our sponsors as well. So it's August 11th, and it is, we call it a showcase. It's one game. And for those of you that are new to town, we have a, this is the true native bumper sticker. For those of you that have moved to Colorado, you could be sporting this uh, at your next party, Coors. Uh, our theme is Beer League, and we have, found that, uh, we have found that individuals are much more loyal to their beer than they are to any team. And... Molly, for those of you from Wisconsin, we do have Leinenkugel from uh, Chippewa Falls, so you could be sporting this as well. So anyway, uh, registration is opening up this week, so we encourage you, if you're a hockey player, please join us. Um, I will also mention the DLs we'll be putting on the second half of the Winter Classic is curling. And for those of you that have never curled, this is a great opportunity to curl and to get out there at the Denver Curling Center. That is in October, so be on the watch for that as well. So thank you, everybody. Look forward to uh, seeing you out there on the rink. Thank you. Thank you so much, James. And when that curling information comes out, sign up soon, because that one always sells out. It, pretty amazing. A um, couple of other events that are coming up, and I want to just read these quickly so I don't miss anything up. So tomorrow... Um, since we can all get back together again, um, everybody wants to do it and, and get back together a lot. So tomorrow we're having our NAOP and BOMA Summer Social uh, with another one of our partners, and that'll be at Interior Environments. Don't miss that. On June 29th, we're going to start a brand new Peer Power Virtual Luncheon Series. It's a free one-hour program, our first Discussion will be led by Odetta Kushi, Deputy Chief Economist for First American Title, who will discuss the pandemic impacts on the commercial real estate market. On July 20th, we'll have our annual mid-year economic forecast breakfast right back here at the Ritz. Don't miss that. And then on July 29th, the developing leaders will be hosting our Real Estate on the Rocks networking event at the Rally Hotel. So be sure if... Those went by pretty quickly. You do have a calendar on your chairs, and you can always go to the website for more information. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started with our program. Just a reminder, um, in sort of our post-pandemic world, our programs are started a little bit later this morning, so it will go until 9.30. Um, 
So for, you can just plan on that. I want to acknowledge the NAOP program committee members who assisted with today's event. Our program's chair, Sarah Crute, Brian Dietz, Bob Blodgett, Aaron Hepp, and Ben Lap Lapidus, excuse me, Ben. Um, one thing of note, you should have at each of your tables a this seat reserved for an expert or a team captain. If there isn't anybody sitting at that spot, that means someone at your table gets to volunteer to be the team captain for our discussion session later in the, in the program. So make sure that um, either someone gets solicited um, or someone volunteers. Um, so it's my honor now at this point to introduce our moderator for our real world economics town hall. Will is a top producing and accomplished real estate professional representing some of the largest and most sought after owners, developers and users who wish to dispose, acquire, develop and finance real estate locally and around the globe. Phew, tired just thinking about all that, Will. He's been involved in the sale, financing, and leasing of over 40 million square feet, valued in excess of 2.5 billion, with a B, dollars, and has completed some of the highest profile and complicated deals in the region. Known for innovative thinking and possessing unique and proven negotiating skills, Will helps clients to achieve the maximum and best value for their real estate assets. I think you're really going to enjoy our moderator today. Will you help me in welcoming to the stage Will Strong? Awesome, thank you. Can I give you this mic right here? Because I, I have one on me. All right, test, test. You've set the expectations way too high. I don't wanna, I wanna under promise and over deliver. Okay, that's the part of our business. So um, thank you for having me, Neop Colorado. Grateful to be here. Um, it's exciting, this is the first event like this in over a year, so I know we're all, we're all excited to be gathered together. Um, so let's start, um, well, for, yeah, first off, good to be back. Um, it's interesting, I watched the video from last year and I encourage you guys to all do that same thing when we had the mayor. It's interesting, it was very uncertain and it's amazing, believe it or not, how much progress we've actually made. Um, if you go back to that video, you know, just the uncertainty and all the challenges, we were right in the thick of it. So it just feels like watching that, and I know it's in the rearview mirror, but I can only imagine where we'll be in a year or two from now. Um, so it was just interesting as I prepared. And the reason why I watched the video is Steve Schwab and Alec Rhodes will absolutely kill me if I screw this up today. So I was preparing, doing flashcards at 4 a.m. this morning, uh, making sure I was ready. Um, today is meant to be really informal. Um, the goal is to get insight from the audience, not from me. Um, we're pleased to be partnering with the Association of General Contractors, specifically Michael Gifford, who you just heard from. Um, and we know how much construction impacts everything we do on a daily basis. The format is town hall, as you guys know. Goal is to cover three high level topics, which I'll mention in a moment. Um, we're gonna ask one person, as mentioned before, to serve as a table captain or liaison to the group. Um, again, we're encouraging discussion, meant to be informal, meant to be conversational. Today's topics are gonna be as follows. Pre-development, entitlement challenges, land costs, permit challenges varying by city and county, um, COVID impacts and land use. Number two, construction costs and pricing on materials, lumber, steel, drywall, et cetera, and labor supply chain issues. And finally, number three, developer perspectives and budget impacts on pro formas, leasing activity, pursuit challenges, and financing. Um, with us today, uh, or some experts with us today are some specific experts that are going to help us with each topic as you saw um, Let's really try and foster conversation among the group today. Um, I think it's going to really benefit us um, We do have a strong turnout of virtual attendees. We have uh, 50 people online So as you're speaking if you want to look into the camera uh, in the back of the room, they're watching um, We're gonna be having table breakouts. So here's the format. We're gonna go through the topics right now in town hall format, we're gonna go around the room, there's gonna be microphones floating, we're gonna have a discussion for about 15 minutes. After we have the discussions and we hear from individual people, we'll go to table breakouts. That'll last for about three to five minutes or so, where um, introduce yourself, talk about what you do, um, you know, hopefully everybody sat by someone you don't know like we were kids again. And at that point, we'll then have someone 
to discuss what was maybe gleaned from those conversations, talk about opportunities, talk about challenges, and then we'll move on to the next topic. Um, so with that, let's go in chronological order um, and let's talk about development. Um, so the first question again, pre-development, entitlement challenges, land costs, permit challenges varying by city and county, COVID impacts in land use. So we have to pick on someone first. So we're gonna to go to Caitlin Quander, who's volunteered to be our first, our first, uh, uh, our first uh, audience member. Yeah, good, morning. Yeah. good morning, everyone. I'm Caitlin Quander. I'm a real estate partner at Brownstein Hyatt Barber Schreck. Um, the bulk of my practice is in land use and entitlement, so a good first topic for me. Uh, I think high level, land use is becoming more complicated and, and complex because all the easy sites, uh, or, or most of them, have been developed. We're really coming down to those complex infill sites. I mean, there's certainly some greenfield further out, but we're seeing uh, communities demand those infill sites get redeveloped and, and a desire by developers to do so. I also think that the expectations from communities, from elected officials, has really gone up. Um, the ability to participate in the process and expectations from electeds around what the development will bring to that community, whether it's uh, local community serving retail, affordable housing, improvements to the public right of way, et cetera, I think have grown. Some things that I'm watching really closely are transportation. Um, I think it's been a focus in Colorado for a long, long time, is one of our barriers, frankly, for development. Uh, and I'm really hopeful that with this federal influx of dollars, we're going to see some great improvements and some funding that comes down, both at the state and local levels, to improve that. And I think it'll be roads, but I think it'll be bikes and um, buses and transportation. We're seeing communities demand that from projects. Denver recently uh, started a transportation demand management plan that you have to submit with your site development plan that would require and facilitate how are you going to have your residents or your office users um, use bikes, use public transportation, et cetera. And that's just an example for Denver. I'm also watching affordable housing really closely. Um, I chair our legislative policy committee for NAOP, and uh, it was a tough legislative session um, with a uh, you know all democratic uh, or all democrat governor, senate, and house. One of the bills that passed is House Bill 1117. What that did, in short, was sort of got the state out of the way on affordable housing. For many, many years, it has been illegal to mandate affordable housing in for rent product. The state has now said it's no longer illegal. Local municipalities can step forward and do so. I think Denver will probably lead that process. Um, they have started their process already with a task force and they're looking at uh, mandating affordable for any new project. Uh, what that will look like exactly, we're still waiting to learn, um, but I think it will be a percentage of the units that are built uh, at a certain AMI. And they're also looking at increasing those linkage fees that Denver put into place pretty substantially. Uh, and then also looking at what are the incentives that they could give to development. Is it some additional density? Is it permit waivers? You know, what is it to hopefully help close that gap um, to build more affordable. I'm also watching tax policy pretty closely. Uh, I, I, I know we've got great uh, uh, resources at the federal level for NAOP, but at the state level, um, and this is how we make le good legislation, is on June 3rd, five days before the legislative session ended, Senate Bill 293 was introduced. Uh, it passed quite quickly, uh, and in short it was it was introduced to try and head off an initiative um, looking at the November ballot. As many of you know, Gallagher was repealed. I think something commercial real estate wanted to have happen, um, but the question was what's going to replace it? And I think we're starting to see that jockeying happen. One of the things that Senate Bill 293 did was it did reduce certain tax rates, you know, the 29% that we're used to for commercial, 7.15% for residential. It broke that into a bunch of different categories. So for a very long time, Colorado has had residential or non-residential. That's it, 29% or the floating um, residential rate, which is currently 7.15. Now we have around six, I think, categories that the bill created. Uh, and uh, it did reduce some of those tax rates, but I think long term, I'm a little worried that it's going to um, uh, try and uh, adjust those where they might, they might target a particular area of commercial real estate, for example, to increase tax rates or, or lower. Um, 
And then the last thing that, that Will was touching on is what is our public process? I'm sure many of you participate in uh, public hearings for rezonings or permits before different cities or counties, and that is the bulk of my work. Uh, when COVID hit, we went remote. Everybody was doing Zoom public meetings and we figured it out. And I think the big challenge now is looking ahead is what does a hybrid look like, which is what most communities are looking at. Ideally, we'd love to see the elected officials in person. I think they uh, are more focused and make better decisions when you can make those connections. But most are maintaining the ability for the public to participate remotely if they're interested. Can you come sit on a bench for five hours on a Monday night? Yes. But I think the ability to do it from the luxury of your home will remain. And I think that can be good and bad, um, and there's a lot of pieces to, uh, to manage with it. Uh, but I think trying to make that connection, um, both with the public in, in different neighborhood meetings or in public meetings, uh, may continue to be difficult uh, if we keep that hybrid model. So those are a few things that I'm tracking, um, and look forward to the conversation with everyone else. Awesome, thank you very much, Caitlin. Any, anyone else before I have to start picking on people? All right, Dan Metzger, your perspective right now, please. And real quick, just for our virtual audience, please use the chat function to share your thoughts. Um, you'll also see a, a Slido link on there. Um, you're gonna see some polling questions as well. So please remember, uh, again, to our virtual audience members, use the chat function. Look for notifications about a Slido link. Just a quick reminder there. Sorry, Dan, thanks. Ram, good morning. Morning, everyone. Uh, Dan Metzger, Chief Operating Officer with Brubaco. We are a uh, commercial real estate investment development firm. I guess my perspective on this, I just want to touch on, uh, is from the entitlement piece. We've, you know, we are a land seller. We're also gone through uh, the entitlement process over the last 15 months ourselves. And some perspectives that, that I can share is just, you know, th there's been some good and bads with this virtual, uh, you know, with the whole virtual thing. And I would say from a, from a good perspective, as we're going through and we're, you know, we're able to talk to ourselves over chat, different chat functions internally and say, all right, we wanna, we wanna make sure we hit on this when, when we have our rebuttal. Um, but I would say by far the, the challenges of virtual uh, hearings, it, it's much, much greater on, on, the, on the negative side. Um, it's harder to read the room to really understand who you're dealing with and understand body language from, from the other side. The other thing I would say is we're seeing more, um, I guess, attacks. Uh, it, it's easier for people who are just kind of talking to their computer screen than when they have to actually look you in the face and talk about your project. So um, I would say the probably the, the worst of both worlds is the hybrid. From our perspective, it's just challenging because it is, you know, as Caitlin mentioned, um, it's, it is easier to get your supporters to come out um, and, and speak on your behalf when they can do it from the luxury of their couch, but that certainly goes on the flip side too. And so um, that's kind of our perspective uh, on the entitlements piece. Um, the other thing I want to touch on, oh, uh, Caitlin mentioned uh, the, the House bill that, or the, this, that passed the state regarding um, affordable housing. I think one of the things we're gonna see, it's gonna be interesting to see how this plays out and when it's up to each municipality, I think every developer in the room has their own favorites uh, from a municipality standpoint. We certainly do. And as this kind of shakes out, you're gonna start to see the, you know, certain municipalities that are much tougher, you're just gonna start to see uh, developers say, you know what, life's too short, it's not worth it. Um, I'm not saying it's gonna be a wholesale shift away from some of those municipalities, but I think you're gonna start seeing that. Awesome, thank you. Nap was nice enough to put me up at the hotel here, if I this next this next uh, this next professional invited me to use his kids' bunk beds if the Ritz was sold out. So John, call me now. Um, where are you there? I appreciate the offer. Um, your perspective, please, on development challenges. My seven-year-old son was really upset that you didn't uh, sleep on the top bunk last night. So. I, I have two boys. I'm fantastic at building Legos. I think you probably slept better here at the Ritz. But anyways, I'm, I'm John Camino of Camino Properties. It's great to see everybody in person. Um, a lot of faces I think all of us hadn't, hadn't seen in a long time. So it's really great to be back together again and um, to, to, to see the market you know, come alive and just the energy and people getting back out and, and doing deals. Um, you know, as an industrial investor and developer, I think 
Um, you know, through the pandemic, we've all seen um, just kind of the continued rise in e-commerce, which I, I think for entitlement risk, really what it's done from um, an industrial perspective is that there's, there's so much there's so much de demand for people to put buildings into production that you're really seeing, you know, kind of fringy sites that are, you know, now becoming the norm. Um, and along with those fringy sites, I think you're seeing just entitlement risk um, really just being, you know, kind of uh, you know, the biggest thing that we all face that uh, of what, you know, the time frames that you typically had to put a site into production and then to stabilize, I think now you're seeing that just really for, for your upfront pre-development um, time. So it's it's more expensive, it's a longer process, there's a lot more risk for, for the for, for the developers. And so it's a really scary thing that we're all, you know, basically is trying to solve for, um, you know, as you put buildings into production and, you know, markets can change, you know, o over time. Uh, so as we were having a conversation in our office yesterday with one of our partners and, um, one of the comments thrown out was uh, a site that only takes 18 months to entitle is essentially shovel ready. Uh, so is that if you had 18 months and another 12 months to build, so is that, and this is for industrial that's typically viewed as fast, you know, uh, to where it's, you know, 30 months is the new norm to deliver, to, to deliver a building. Um, so I think you're just seeing to, from industrial perspective, to put buildings into production just a lot more risk being taken by developers and land land sellers seeing the the demand and the amount of competition from you know developers across the country and capital across the world that are trying to be active in our market uh, and just really it's there's value in scarcity and there's a tremendous amount of scarcity in land and the land that's available uh, is is very hard to build on so I mean I think for me is just to keep it simple it's it's supply and demand is forcing developers to take more risk and uh, it costs more and it's taking longer, so. Thanks, John. Any, before we move into the table breakouts, anyone uh, have anything up more to share to the group on development challenges? All right, let's do it. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna have our first table breakout. Um, again, the format is introductions, what segment of the industry you represent, um, experience, and this is meant to be just three to five minutes, and then we're gonna reconvene, and we're just gonna pick on a couple tables at random uh, to share feedback, so please start now. said something, but I'll, 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 I'll do it again. Yeah.
for the gold leaf. Okay, cool. Okay. All right. Thank you. Awesome. I just want you guys to walk away thinking it was thinking it was good. So, okay. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, one minute warning. One minute warning, everyone. Time to conclude your conversations, please. Sounds like a lot of dialogue.
Okay, time to share, team. Get make sure, I know you're not used to having business cards or being in person anymore, but everyone can follow up later. All right, quick reminder, the chat function is open for our virtual attendees. Um, so feel free to open up and share. Please keep your uh, eyes open for the polling questions, which are gonna come up from time to time. And then if you do speak, please remember to look at the camera. Remember we do have those virtual audience members. So um, wanna make sure we uh, address our friends in the audience there. So uh, sounded, sounded like a lot of discussion. Sorry to interrupt. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure we, could, we could do it all day. Um, so um, who wants to go first? Who wants to share what their table I see some fingers pointing. <laughs> does, does anyone want to share? Any hands? OK. I, honestly, a little loud here. Uh, this is my big mouth. But I think um, this is a really good follow-up to our question here with their Miller's Landing project. So uh, pass it off to them, and they've got a pretty good story for you that's kind of a sign of the times. So. Me, 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 me. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think the entitlement risk question and, the, and, and all the other stuff we were talking about is we had a fully baked deal before the pandemic. And then we've run into market changes and into political risk because everybody we started with is a whole new town council, basically. And our deal is a mixed use development and an urban renewal authority with a business improvement district and we successfully removed the town landfill. And then we had a shared vision and a true P3, but now because of the, the, the time it extra it took the landfill to get situated and the pandemic, the market has changed down there. And so it's taken a whole longer period of time to educate the current uh, stakeholders and the new stakeholders, and then we're adjusting our uh, public finance agreement to meet today's conditions. So it's, you know, time hurts deals and complications hurt deals. But, you know, we think uh, we've got good things happening for the town and the development. So that's kind of the things that we've been living through the last year. Interesting. Thanks for sharing. Any other tables want to share? All right, going to Tom Glissmeyer. By the way, Someone referred to him as Tom to me the other day. He's Gliss, okay, if you see him around. Thanks, Will. So that's, yeah. he's more commonly known as Gliss. Appreciate it, thanks. Um, I'm gonna put Amy on the spot. Uh, she had an interesting comment about uh, how some folks are viewing Colorado in the political risk. So the comment I brought up was just recognizing that with um, commodity pricing increasing and with kind of competition here, we're starting to see people lose interest in the Colorado market and it's creating opportunity for a lot of outside, more national or international development companies to come in and take um, advantage of opportunities here because they have a little bit long, stronger portfolio, so they've got a little bit more um, opportunity to take advantage of performer risk. And the concern that I have there is just seeing that we're getting people who are coming into our market without understanding the intricacies of what Denver is facing. We're talking about transportation, affordable housing, education, all the different elements that we as a community are trying to fix. The more that we push out our local developers or have our more, um, I guess, local feel move away, we may have more complexities and issues facing some of those challenges and creating um, opportunities. Great. Very interesting. Okay, awesome. Well, this next topic, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, please, Caitlin, please. <laughs> um, uh, just to tag on a couple of topics that our table covered that, that weren't discussed is um, John raised uh, water, and water has always been a Colorado issue, but certainly we see um, some communities have really shored up water well, Denver, Aurora, and there are other communities, Thornton being one that comes top of mind that um, has essentially halted development at this point until they com are able to complete their water project and build the pipeline. Um, and in litigation with Weld and uh, Larimer County is over it. So always, um, especially for those coming from out of state, as you mentioned, I think learning what water is in Colorado is a, uh, an educational process. <laughs> up in, <clears throat> and then the other thing that Aaron um, was sharing is around green building, renewables, um, and the expectations around efficiencies of buildings that, um, and you put it, uh, 
sometimes that whatever certification it is that you're trying to get here in Denver, it, it's almost more of a marketing tool because the expectations are that you will be at that level, frankly. And so I think that that's um, a piece that we'll continue to see at the state level and at the local level to really up up those uh, different requirements of the building code and green building codes. Um, so hopefully we can all rise to that occasion. <laughs> great, great perspective. Thank you. Okay, so next topic is construction. So obviously on the forefront of everyone's minds, it seems. Um, so remember the, the, the topic here is construction costs and pricing on materials, not to um, eliminate anything, but lumber, steel, drywall, et cetera, labor and supply chain issues. Um, really excited, Michael Giffords has prepared a little bit uh, of, uh, of slides here to, to talk through. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna turn it over right to Michael and let him, um, let him do his thing. Well, and um, we get to go through some uh, tough information here, but I'm an optimistic person, so I'm going to do it in as optimistic a way as possible. And what I want to start uh, is ask uh, Jamer to bring up the pr first slide. I wanted to look back on construction material price increases and see this feels worse than past, uh, past price increases. And looking at the graph here, what you see is going back to 2000. The highest price increase before this current one in total uh, was 2008, and this is the month of April at 12.9%. And you'll see over to the right the current increase over the last 12 months, 19% through April. But spoiler alert, I uh, looked at the updated numbers from the Bureau of Labor Statistics last night for May, and it's now 24% uh, uh, over the last 12 months. Uh, next slide, please. And this is looking at that 24%. I was able to update this slide, uh, but the BLS tells us that they also measure bid price by general contractors, and that is a 2.8% increase over the last 12 months, which means that especially the trade contractors underneath the general contractor have been trying to absorb a lot of these price increases in the short run. But my message is that um, that's pretty much coming to an end. And we've got a couple of major general contractors that are going to follow me, and I, th I think they'll tell you the same experience. Next slide, please. This shows the producer price index for individual products. And you see at the top there is lumber and plywood, and that's 111%. That's at the sawmill or at the manufacturing point. The price increases are going to be even greater in June on the ground in Denver. But I think uh, my optimistic side says we might hear some uh, good news about futures prices coming up. Uh, but this lays out all the various uh, costs that go into that 24% increase. Now, I will say that AGC, uh, working with a few other groups, has conducted a lobbying campaign to address tariffs and quotas at the national level but um, I'm here to tell you that that effort is not uh, uh, bearing fruit, and the current administration actually is doubling down and going a little bit more towards uh, protecting U.S. business with Buy America, uh, additional quotas and tariffs, uh, so that's not going to give us any relief uh, in this arena. I did not put a slide up here on labor, but I just want to comment uh, very quickly that we're at 175,000 employees today, all in, in Colorado for commercial, residential, and transportation construction employees. We're projected to go to 220,000 by 2027, so there is gonna be continued upward pressure on labor prices, but not nearly as dramatic as what you saw on the material side. So I don't think that's gonna be the, the culprit, but it's just gonna be a challenge in terms of a timeline to deliver projects as we get to that 220,000 employee mark. Uh, next slide, please. A uh, bit of good news, net in migration over time is slowing, and that's, that's a natural, national trend in terms of population gain, uh, but it is continuing, and the state demographer says it'll be somewhere in the 25 to 50,000 range going forward, so that's going to continue uh, demand to build more commercial as well as residential, so that's another thing that we're watching in the market. And um, commercial construction starts, as measured by Dodge data, are down about 25 to 30 percent 
year over year comparing to last year, while residential is up quite a bit. But as we look at the leading indicators, like the Dodge Momentum Index up 8.6% from last year, and the Architectural Billings Index is at 57, it was 30 years ago, a year ago, and those are architects being hired for new design contracts. So we know commercial is gonna be coming back long term because there's so much in the entitlement phase that we've just been talking about and in the design phase. Uh, so that's going to bring additional demand as well, which all goes back to those uh, construction materials prices. And when we look back at that first graph, I think it's going to be a longer curve instead of a drop right down. And so we're going to need to manage all uh, through that. And well, I think our next two presenters are going to give us more specifics, real world economics on, on how they're working through that. Great. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, all right. Any, anyone, anyone have a question for Michael before we before we go go to some some individuals on any of that information? Clearly, you can follow up and, and, and take a deeper dive. All right. Dave Rom, your perspective, please. Hi, Dave Rom with Brinkman Constructors. I'm one of our local project directors, so I handle a a big portion of our market here in the Denver area, some stuff in Utah, Nevada. Um, specifically, I'm going to address steel, hot topic, obviously, um, very volatile, changes daily. I just read last night, this morning, that Nucor just announced another price increase on flat stock steel to hit the market immediately. Um, we have seen steel prices rise anywhere from 20 to 70 percent, just like Michael's slide show, showed from last year to today, um, which is hampering a lot of things. Additionally, your delivery times or your lead times on steel has gone from six to eight weeks about a year ago. Depending on your size of project and how interested it, say, New Millennium is or Nucor or whoever, your lead time might be six to nine months. So we're having to adjust as a general contractor how these lead times affect us, which in turn just trickles down to finishing the building, labor costs, how long we're on site, how long your building gets completed, et cetera, et cetera. Um, really, I just want to open it up to questions about steel, any, any other pricing issues, questions you all have. Sure. So real quick for the virtual, because you'd have a microphone, the question is, how are the price, how is the price volatility impacting the lead times? Okay, so, so typically when, when a general contractor, Brinkman or whoever, let's call it a 500,000 square foot industrial tilt, concrete tilt-up building, we order joists and deck, we account for a lead time of say a year ago, six to eight weeks, and then the installation time of say two months as an example. Now those lead times that have gone from six to eight weeks to six to nine months, we, what we're doing now is we're kind of offering up two suggestions. We can either kind of postpone the start of the project because we're not gonna have the material there to install it. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for us to mobilize immediately and just go like gangbusters, bust out your project because then we're gonna get to a point where we have to sit and wait for the steel to arrive or we're gonna outline for you, hey, if we start today, we're gonna to go ahead and we're gonna do all your site work, we're gonna do the concrete, then we're gonna have this period of waiting for the steel to show up. It's gonna be X number of days or months, and then we're gonna finish the building out. And what we're gonna do is we will outline for you, okay, that your typical schedule, let's say it was 12 months a year ago, now it's gonna be 16 months, 18 months, whatever it is with that lead time. And what that does is that affects us as a general contractor because now we have longer times on the site, so your general conditions increase. So given the root causes behind this pricing, thank you, given the root causes behind this price and availability crunch, and then all the pent up demand with the projects going on right now, what's your outlook for where, for when normalization might occur, or is your take that this is the new normal? Yes. 
Now, no, I, we are optimistic. Now, I would say, me personally, and I, I'm a construction guy, but I try to pay attention to really the markets and everything from the start of a product, right? I would say first quarter of next year, things will somewhat normalize. Now, what that new normal is, I, I really wish I could tell you. Now, we were talking at our table, you know, your steel's gone up 70%, say, in a year. I do believe the price will come down, let's call it 25%. It's going to give us all this warm fuzzy, oh, prices have come down, but yet we're still sitting X percentage above what we were in 2020. So there's your new cost. Interesting. Anyone have another question? Good question for Dave. Matt Mitchell. Nucor um, are giving you guidance on on time frame to deliver the steel to your site. Are they sticking to those schedules generally, or are they over promising, under delivering? I mean, how how reliable are you as a general contractor at accurately predicting schedule and not having delays coming so, from them? So delivery times they've been really good. They still have been. If if they tell us six months, it's been six months. If they you know once we set a date, they've been fairly good about that. We've had a, we had a couple phone calls prior to this and talking about delivery times, talking about are they increasing their prices even though we've contracted with them. A week ago I said no. In the last week we've had two suppliers come to us and they've been contracted and they said here's your price increase. We said, you know, we're contracted with a developer owner. We've been contracted with you for a month, two months. We've had suppliers tell us, well, we're not going to supply the job then. Here's our, here's our price increase after we've contracted with them. Um, and I would be remiss not to, I don't want to bring more bad news, but you've probably heard roofing insulation has now become an issue. Literally in the last week, we've had four jobs where all the major suppliers have told us what you could get roofing insulation 12 weeks up until about January. We have a building going that we're going to start in Erie. It's a new Lowe's uh, store. They told us on bid day about six weeks ago, it was a 14 week lead time. Friday, the supplier called us and said, it's 265 days to get your roof insulation. So those are some of the, as the general contractor, it puts us in a really tough spot. We hate to go to the owner and say, hey, you know, what do, what do we do? But we, we like to be in a partnership. You know, how can we figure this out? Do we go to the supplier and say, hey, we're going to switch? But we've had all the major suppliers tell us, you know, your lead times went from 12 to 14 weeks to six months, nine months out. So. Uh, my question is actually from the owner perspective, right? So your client. So obviously you're having to break the information in the news and when they're renegotiating the contract once it's been signed. How is that coming across towards you, right, as Brinkman? Are the owners and your clients, are they accepting that because they understand it's happening? Or is it making it a lot more difficult for you? Both. It, it, it's really client specific. I was actually on a call with a major developer yesterday. We brought up the roof situation and they were very understanding. They said, okay, what are our options? As of yesterday afternoon, we basically had two options. We're gonna have a call this afternoon and decide which way we go. You know, whether that's we split the cost, whether we switch suppliers, manufacturers, whether we even switch the roofing subcontractor to figure out if we can find somebody else that has a better, a better way of getting this project done on time. So it's, it's really client specific. All right, great questions. We, oh. We got one more here, and then we got to go to our tables. In a situation where the supplier is not in subcontract price, and anticipating that, as you're writing new GMP contracts, because by definition, that should be the contractor's risk, right? Sure. You're signing subcontracts. Are you putting new escalation in? We are. Dave, can you repeat the question real quick, just for the virtual audience? Yeah, so what he's asking is, as, we, as we're facing these issues, essentially, and we have a GMP contract, are we as a general contractor now including specific language to address price increases? And the answer is yes, we are. And really what we do is once we start the contract negotiations, 
That's one of the first things we're talking about and, it, and it, we come to state, a statement or statements about how we as a, as a partnership are gonna address if there's a price increase, how do we handle it? And again, really client specific. Some of them have been really open to it. Some of them are kind of like, it's your deal, your responsibility. So what I would say, and what's really tough for us is we contract with the owner, we contract with the subcontractor, supplier, and then weeks or months later, they're coming to us and saying, you're just not gonna get it if you don't pay us. So what do we all do? And, and that's where, you know, we, we exert a lot of pressure on them, but we're just looking for, hey, we gotta figure out together how we're gonna fix this, so. All right, make Dave your best friend so you know what's going on, <laughs> is the takeaway. Um, real quick, before we move, I wanna go to Jim Meller. He's got a very cool lumber visual that I'd like to look at, so Jim, please take it away. And um, yes, now that the audience is all happy and giddy, here we go. Uh, <laughs> we talk about shortages and certainly uh, uh, supplies on steel is issue, but I get question every week, you know, what happened to lumber? Anybody been to Home Depot recently and watch your sheet of plywood go from about $10 to $80 uh, a sheet of plywood? So it's, it's a, a heck of a, a bump that we're seeing in uh, lumber prices. And so the question is, is that I get asked is what happened? Why are we here? What are we doing here? And then how do we get out of it? So as you look at this chart, you can see since last May where pricing has gone. And of course, we're not alone in lumber in seeing this, but the uh, cost on this, just the net cost on all of this is the average house today, 2,300 square foot house, the average house price has increased $36,000. So that's going across to uh, you know all consumers throughout. And new home price, new home lumber is number one driver. Renovations is second. Apartments coming in third in terms of supply and use of lumber. So you look at this and you go, okay, from a peak, and I've got some uh, numbers down here. From a peak of uh, watching our pricing go up. It's dropped uh, just in the last week. These are futures, by the way. This is not lumber prices. These are futures. We've seen a 40% drop as of Monday in future pricing. So we're hoping that we'll see lumber pricing come down. No guarantee, as Michael uh, mentioned earlier, the price you pay on the ground is a little bit different. A lot of factors in, involved in that. Uh, but why has this happened? Well, COVID is a big part of that when all of this uh, lumber uh, issues really were exasperated by COVID, but it started way back in 2000 when the um, we have ash borers here and the pine beetles that the Pacific Northwest wiped out 60 percent, 44 million acres, 60 percent of the Canadian and Pacific Northwest saleable lumber stock. Then you bring in to the 2008, the Great Recession. What happened in that period of time was housing starts dropped 49%. 30 of our lumber mills across America shut down out of business, out of production. Then you fast forward again and you go into COVID. So what happens when COVID hits? The lumber mills are going, whoops, we're gonna have another downturn. We're gonna, we're gonna scale it down. So they scaled down their production 40%, not foreseeing that interest rates were gonna hit an all time low for your mortgages and demand was gonna just shoot through the roof. So we've watched our supply drop, we've watched our uh, productivity get scaled down, and then the demand just off the charts. So pricing has gone up over 500% since last March to the peak, which was in May. May alone, we saw a 30% jump in prices on lumber. As I said, the good news is, as of Monday, futures are down 40%, so we're hoping to see that come back down. Next slide, if you would, Jema. This is, I think, for those of you who don't do graphs real well, like myself, I like this. If you had bought back in May, if you had spent $50,000 on a lumber pack, you could have built, as you see at the bottom of that, 10 homes, 10 2,300 square foot homes. We got enough lumber for that. Today, two homes. 
So that's the, that's the reality of what we're seeing is prices jump from $343 per thousand board feet up to $1,635 per thousand board feet in the lumber market. So it's, a, it's an exciting time, yep, in, in our industry for sure. So what are we doing about it? Well, as an industry as a whole, um, and by the way, I want to back up just for a second because part of the supply problem is the supply chain. Yes, we've had diminished, but we also, you'll see, and I don't know if you look on it, but go online and you'll see miles and miles of rail cars with lumber sitting on it, waiting to be delivered. We don't have any truckers anymore. They've all aged out of our, of our uh, workforce. Not a lot of guidance counselors are telling seniors in high school really should go into the trucking industry. Um, so we're, we're facing it as a construction industry across the board in all of our trades, whether it's truckers or skilled craftsmen, um, a huge uh, loss in our workforce. And I know we've got lots of issues facing us, John, water being one of them, but so is our labor force coming up. So getting the lumber from the mills to your home, to your apartment project is causing real problems too. And as long as that keeps going, prices are gonna stay up. So I wanna make two guarantees for you today. And one of the guarantees is, is I'm coming out of, the, of uh, my research, is that we are gonna see prices drop. We're gonna see them come down through the rest of this year, 2020. Two, we'll see prices come down. I think we'll see a normalized pricing range, which has been in the two to four hundred dollars per thousand board square feet for the last 10, 15 years, and has jumped up to 1,600. We're going to start seeing prices normalize in that 500 to 1,000 dollar per thousand board feet. So that's the good news. My second guarantee that I want to pass on to you, and this is an absolute guarantee, is that all my guarantees are wrong. So. <laughs> Do that with what you want, but I look at the previous chart and I think if I'm a developer, you know, when do I push the button? When do I say buy? Who knows? Are we, are we, we've had prices, case in point, we're doing a 81 unit, 81 unit 80,000 square foot senior uh, apartment project up in um, northern Colorado right now. December, our lumber pack was 1.2 million. March, 2.5 million. Last week, 2.7 million. When do you pull the trigger? What do you do as a developer to figure out the right price? I don't have an answer for you, but I do think teaming up with your general contractor, teaming up with your lumber supplier, watching those futures on a daily basis and seeing when the right time to pull the trigger and make it happen. The lumber suppliers are holding their prices, and this is great news, for 48 hours not days. So you get 48 hours to say, okay, we'll, we'll place our order and here's our payment. Otherwise, as uh, David said earlier, two days from now, a whole new price. So teaming up, having a good team partner to go with and say, we're in this together, let's make this thing successful, is really, to me, the best strategy. We at Pinker Construction have taken on the risk of buying the lumber packs ourselves. We don't, no longer subcontract out for that. We'll buy it, so we're teaming up with our developers to, to lock in prices, guarantee them as best we can, get the money in, get the payments. We'll, we'll um, see shipping of lumber in about 30 to 60 days. That's good news. Bad news is if you're not ready for it, if we're buying lumber early, schematic level design, get the lumber package bought because that's the right price, then we've got to find a warehouse or someplace to store it so that one, it doesn't grow legs, and two, that um, once it's in a bonded warehouse, we can get financing and get, get payments through. So it's a, it's a fun time, for sure. Never thought, thought I'd ever see any time like this in my career, but it does require a, a whole different level of collaboration, cooperation between the teammates and stakeholders. All right, table discussions. It's gonna be a little quick this time. Thank you, Jim. He'll be around if you guys wanna talk. That, that, that's fascinating, great, great visual. So. Let's do a quick three to five minute table, same format, please. Thank you. Just, I just wanna give a quick update. Go ahead and do your table discussions. I'm really speaking to our, our virtual attendees. 
Um, we do want you to participate. You have questions. You have to open the chat. If you look up in the top right-hand corner of your screen, there's a little bubble, like if you were seeing me think about things. Click on that bubble. That will open your chat, and then you can submit questions. So please feel free for our virtual attendees to participate. Submit your questions. We'll read those in and get those answered. And also do the online poll. Thank you. One minute warning, one minute warning. All right, please conclude. Thank you very much. All right, anyone want to share anything interesting? 
Lots to digest there. All right. Where's Kiefer at? Where's my man? There. How'd your table do? Uh, we, we were good. Really, the, the main concern we were talking about is, is labor. Um, and with, I mean, subcontractors not being able to even bid on jobs. So if you, if you go to a GC um, and they have to go out to multiple subs and get their bids, some of them are passing on it because they can't source the materials or get the labor to, uh, to perform on that. Interesting, interesting. Anyone else? Awesome. All right, we're gonna move into our third topic just to keep pace with, um, with the schedule here. So the, the third and final, um, the final topic is the developer perspective, um, budget impacts on pro forma, leasing activity, pursuit challenges, and financing. So um, really quickly, so I lead Cushman and Wakefield's uh, institutional sales team for the Southwestern US. And so, Jim, if you don't mind, I just wanna just really quickly, just a little bit different perspective, more from a you know, national, North American capital markets perspective. So everyone wants to talk about Amazon. Um, this is just meant to be a simple visual showing the light, the light bars are net absorption of, just every, not to make it all about industrial, but obviously Amazon's a big topic. The light bars are traditional net absorption. The dark blue bars represent e-commerce. Clearly e-commerce has been a strong driver. It's no surprise. You hear about Amazon, you hear about some of the the e-fulfillment. The, the e uh, so here it is in a visual. Next slide, please. So this is just the debt markets and how liquid they are right now. So you can see all the different product types. I'm happy to send these around if you reach out to me. Um, and so you know, basically what the takeaway on is hotel and retail um, is still struggling. Um, the industrial debt markets are strong. So, but you can see overall the lending activity across the entire board is still below, um, below previous years. And the red, the red represents first quarter 2021, um, the amount of debt originations that have taken place for each segment. So I'll give maybe five more seconds here to look at that. All right, next one, please. So there's a lot going on here. Hopefully no one's head explodes. Um, I need someone to translate this for me as well. Um, so this is, just, this is just sales volume. Keep it as simple. So the different colored lines that are going um, that are going up, those are just um, different years. So pay attention to the very dark blue line. That's 2021. The takeaway here is every product type is still down year over year. Industrial is down the least, as you can as you can you can guess. So industrial sales volumes only down six percent. Apartments it's down 18 percent, um, and then obviously retail. 53% in office at 35%. Probably no surprises there. Next slide, please. On a more encouraging note, this is capital that's built up right now. So what this is showing is dry powder for North American closed end real estate funds. And so you can see, you know, again, meant to be a simple visual, visual, but the different colors just represent the type of capital that's out there. The orange is debt, the dark gray is core capital, the maroon is core plus, Yellow is value add, blue is opportunistic, the dark blue is distressed, and then other is red. So again, meant to, meant to show you that there's you know, $225 billion um, waiting to be deployed. So I think it's important to note from a Denver perspective, Denver feels like it's top three on everyone's list, uh, with some exceptions, but from my perspective, being a regional national capital markets leader, it feels like Denver just comes up on every phone call. So it's interesting hearing the local economic and the local municipalities. And then you think about all the capital that wants to continue to push into the space. And then I think we have one more slide, Jima, uh, or two more. So this is just really quickly meant to show you the spreads between buying bonds and buying investment grade credit. So clearly you hear about the Amazons that are selling um, a, lot of the, a lot of the investment grade deals and you try to wonder how are cap rates continuing to compress. And so I think Denver, you know, like any market, there's still a healthy spread between the primary tier one markets and then also um, between bonds. So again, meant to just show you the difference between what you can buy the bonds for and what cap rates are. And then those white boxes just show the spread between buying those. So it's meant to be more encouraging that there's still value in buying the real estate itself. And then there might be one more, Jima. 